that are shaking and stirred can be calmed and broken from my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all. Oh
chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my way into May, believe it or not, into COVID. And uh, it's a great day, no matter what's going on in the world, for sharing the Word of God. And I want to bring you up to speed a little bit on some of the questions that I've been 
been asked here recently and focus that into the word of God if we possibly can. One of the questions I'm getting a lot is, is this the end time? In fact, uh, I'm just going to be real honest with you. I'm getting questions like, um, is this new vaccine going to be the mark of the beast? Is it going to do something to us and uh, associated with revelation and all of these questions that we're getting now? And uh, it's uh, I just I want to I want to focus on that for just a minute and, and bring you paint this with a broad brush for just a minute. Here we are where we're closer to the end of time, obviously, than we've ever been. But. I want us to look at some of the signs that are in the end times and see how they are starting right now. Now, the gospel is good news and it's bad news. It's great news for those who believe in Jesus Christ and know that he's their savior and they're never going to be separated from him from all eternity. They're not going to hell. They're not going to suffer for all eternity. They're not going to be separated from their loved ones that know Christ. That's great news for them. But it's also terrible news that those that reject Christ, those that persist in unbelief, those that put off every opportunity, they will be judged. And I keep getting the question, is this the day of the Lord? Is this the end day? Is this that day that the Bible talks about? And so I want to focus, first of all, on what is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is talked about 19 times in the Old Testament, four times in the New Testament. And if I were to go to all the references, we could go, I'm going to go to just one. I think I'm going to go to Isaiah, and I want you to look there with me, if you will, and let's look in Isaiah 13. Now, I could take them from Joel, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah. I could go to uh, Jeremiah. I could go to many places in the Old Testament where the day of the Lord is talked about. But let's read here, and then I'm going to define it for you. He says in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6, Wail. For the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. And every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will, they will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment. Their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury, burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold. Think about that. And mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. So that doesn't sound very positive, does it? That's the day in which God is going to judge the world. I guess if we had to say something, we'd say, today it's really man's day. Could even say it's Satan's day. He's the prince of the power of the air. He still have a somewhat of a false lease on the earth. The Jesus said that, we're all in his lap, so to speak. And so in this time, it would be correct, I think, to say that this is his hour. But his hour is getting close to being over. And then it's going to be the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord in which he gathers up his people, places them in his kingdom for all of eternity, rewards his servants 
and we have the incredible life to come. But not so for those who've rejected God. They're going to see horrors on this earth that are unbelievable. Now, let me just say, let me just categorize this as, as quickly as I can because I'd have to go through the book of Revelation really to, to make you understand the totality of this and the uh, uh, just ferociousness of it. If we look in 1 Thessalonians chapter, let's begin in 4, uh, verse 13. Verses 13 through 18 are about the rapture. Now, what is that? The rapture is when God snatches up, takes his people up. That's an unexpected event. We don't know when that's going to happen. In fact, there's not anything in the Bible that has to happen before that happens. And so that can happen at any time. Everything that needs to happen has happened. Christ has come in his first coming as suffering Savior, vicariously atoning for our sins rejected, beaten, crucified, risen, ascended back to heaven, his first coming. That's how he came as a babe in Bethlehem, but he's not coming that way again. He's coming as a victorious warrior, leader, reclaimer. He's coming in all of his glory. The Bible says we'll see as the lightning from the east to the west will be his coming. Now, if I had to say a couple of things that would happen, we'd have the rapture first. Then, after the rapture, the reason I say this is because the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Although the things that are happening now are very similar, but so much smaller in comparison to the horrors that are going to be released on this earth in the next years to come. And as the severity of these things, pestilence, that's disease, which we're having now, worldwide disease, which I don't remember us ever having this, taking place right now, but only a forerunner, a harbinger, a, a little prototype, of the thing that will be real in the future. But so horrific, so terrible in the day of the Lord. Now, Revelation tells us, and I'm going to go back to Matthew 24 here in just a minute. In fact, let, let me read uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's talking about the day of the Lord. He said, Now as to the times and the epochs or the seasons, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Let me define that for just a minute. There's an unexpected aura, uh, a, a presence of the rapture. We don't know when that's gonna take place. Similarly, we don't know when the day of the Lord's gonna take place. We know after we're gone, the tribulation is going to start a time of suffering and events that this world has never known is going to take place after that. And during that seven years, at the end of that, Christ is going to come back. Now, what's going to take place? We know that the uh, uh, sun's going to be darkened. The moon's going to turn to blood. Stars are going to fall out of the sky. There's going to be a war that encompasses the entire world, Armageddon. All of these things are coming. They will come. There is no stopping them. They're a part of this day of the Lord. Now, this day of the Lord will come in all of its ferociousness at the end of the tribulation. That will be, in fact, let me just give you a couple of things. If we were to go to... Um, uh, the Revelation chapter 6, uh, we would see the, the four horsemen, and we would see this false peace, and then we'd see, see worldwide war, and then, we'd, then, you, then you would see famine, and then you would see death, and you would see this unfolding of all of these things that are taking place. For instance, in the seven trumpets, you've got the seals, the trumpets, and then you would have the bowls. 
But in the seven trumpets, one third of all vegetation is destroyed. A meteor falls from the sky. One third of the sea life is destroyed. One third of the fresh water. One third of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Scorpion-like demons are released from hell to torment mankind. If you can imagine that. That's a reality. It's going to happen. It's not Chronicles of Narnia. It's not uh, uh, Tolkien's uh, trilogy. It, it's, it's, it's not make-believe. It's, it's real. It's coming. Now, and then the bowls get even worse because in them, all of mankind is affected. Sores on mankind. All of the sea life, it dies. All fresh water it becomes polluted. The sun is so hot, it burns everybody. There is no way. The Bible says if it were not for the elect's sake, in God shortening the days, nobody could have survived it. That's what's coming. That's what's ahead for mankind. And what does he say? He's coming like thief in the night. But let me, let me read these words to you. He said, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. I've been in on seven pregnancies, seven births. And here's what happens. And I'm not, this is not news to you that are mothers. At first you have a birth pain, uh, you have a labor pain and it's separated maybe by uh, 10 minutes and then they get eight minutes, six minutes, four minutes, two minutes. And then they become increasingly severe in pain and they become increasingly frequent. That's what's going to happen as we approach the day of the Lord. All of these things are coming now. But what is he saying here? He's telling us, he says, but you brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief for all are all of you are sons of light. And sons of day, we are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober for those who sleep, do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet and the hope of salvation. Then he says, for God has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation. Our destiny as Christians is a glorious one, a magnificent one. In fact, in the day of the Lord, we're already going to be up in heaven. We're going to be raptured. If you're living right now and you're a Christian, we're going to be raptured. We're going to come back with him. And this magnificent appearance of Christ, it says on horses, on white horses, we don't know exactly what that means. It may be literally just white horses. Flying white horses, can you imagine? But we're going to come back with him. In this day in which he judges mankind that's rejected him, and he takes those that are his, us and all of those that are living that have accepted him, and takes them into his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and rewards them incredibly. Now, that's what's coming. So my advice to you and my preaching to you with the questions that I'm getting is this. Don't focus on the fact that this could be the mark of the beast or is this. Truthfully, it's getting very close, not just chronologically in years. It's always been getting closer, but it's getting closer with the signs of the time. It's getting closer with the epics that we're told about in scripture. Now let's go back to another place where this is shared, Matthew 24. And the question from the disciples is here in verse three, they pull him apart privately and they say, tell us when these things are going to, going to happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? We want to know when, you know, they asked the same thing in Acts chapter one and they were always wanting to know, when are you going to set up the kingdom? When are you going to destroy the wicked? When are you going to bring in your magnificent empire, almighty God? And he said, he started laying out for them a map 
of what's going to take place. And it is so bone chilling what it says that it give me, gives me cold chills right now thinking about it. And I want to read it for you. Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you or deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place. But that's not the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. But all of these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. Remember, we talked about that in Thessalonians. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations that the end will come. Now, all of this is going to take place during the tribulation, an event that will take place after we are ejected out of this earth, snatched away in the rapture to go back with God. But let's think about what these characteristics are. He says there'll be many false teachers. So deception is going to be a characteristic of this age that we're talking about here. Now, there's huge deception out there right now. When I think of the cults, when I think of all of the things that I could go through New Age Scientology, I could give you a whole gamut of things that are out there. Unbelievable. People are still religious. There's still a desire in them to have something else that gives them meaning in life besides what they do every day. There is a heart-shaped vacuum inside of you that only God can fill. And if people don't want the God of the Bible, they're going to find some other religion of some other sort that they're going to believe in. It might even be atheism, but it's still a religion that they're going to believe in in order to soothe their conscience and make them feel like they've got something in life. Now, when I think about deception... It's coming. I mean, there's, uh, think about it for just a minute in Revelation. We're going to be ejected. We're going to be gone. There's going to be millions of people gone. And all these false prophets are going to give all these reasons why it's happened. And they're going to be so effective that they're going to deceive the world. You think, well, there'd be a great revival after we're gone because people are going to say, hey, the Bible's true. Not so. They're going to be deceived. And they're actually going to give themselves over to sin on a level that's never been done before. Imagine that. The Bible says that the restrainer is going to be taken out. That's the Holy Spirit. When we're gone, the Holy Spirit goes with us. And so the world is left in all of its evil with demons running everywhere to parade sin in, in such a way that the temptation of it, the enticement of it, will almost be that you cannot withstand it. Now, that kind of deception's coming, but it's already here. Now, we've got the coronavirus. I'm not trying in any way to underestimate that. But if you compare that with what's going to happen in Revelation, if you compare that with the millions of one-third of mankind destroyed, all I mean, all of mankind, we're talking billions of people killed in a three and a half year period and even less time than that at the end of the great tribulation. This thing is going to be unbelievable. It's coming. And I, I say this over and over as I get to these different characteristics. What is our responsibility? Us that know Christ is what? If you see somebody about to walk off a cliff, what do you do? You warn them. You warn them. You say, stop, man. Don't do it. Don't step over there. You'll, you'll die. We ought, to be, we ought to be getting more and more compelled 
our comeuppance, our courage, our braveness ought to be reaching a level because of COVID that we realize we're getting very close, not only to living a worldwide pandemic, we're getting closer to the end of time in which these things are going to be released on a level that we've never before seen. The world. So what do we want to do? We want to respond with hope. We want to respond with, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to, you know, looking at all these conspiracy theories and all these things, the people that are behind this. And I'm sure there's truth to lots of that. It doesn't matter what instrument that God allows the devil to use. He's still, I mean, he's going to give him pretty much a free ticket during tribulation, during the years to come. And we're already seeing some of that, aren't we? Disease is not of God. God's allowing it. But disease came in with sin. And the Bible says all those that hate God love death. I mean, Satan loves this thing. I mean, this is, this is his, I mean, this is his world. I mean, this is what he loves. Death, killing folks. That's, that's, what, that, that's what he gets excited about. And so this is starting to be very close to the end of time in which he has almost unlimited power in a world. And he comes through the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is gonna rule the world. And so there's coming a day in which the reality of Satan being in power is coming. Now, the first one is deception. The second one is war. And we could go to um, Revelation chapter 6 and we could talk about the fact that uh, he rides his horse, the Antichrist does, and he, but he doesn't, have any, he doesn't have any arrows. He just has a bow, which means he's going to be bringing a false peace to the world but it doesn't hold. And then worldwide war, war and rumors of war on a scale we've never known before is going to be breaking out. And in fact, it'll culminate at the end of the great tribulation with the battle of Armageddon, where all of the peoples of the world come together in the Valley of Megiddo, there in Jerusalem for the greatest battle the largest, most horrific battle of all mankind. It is going to be a bloodbath such as the world has never seen. I think 60 million died in World War II. That will be nothing compared to the carnage and the slaughter that is coming. Now, global war. And then... We're talking about in uh, Revelation 6, 12 and here he's talking about these earthquakes, famines, these disastrous things, these pestilences, all of these things that are coming, these natural disasters, tsunamis, these are coming. That's the third thing that's going to take place. And then he goes on and he tells us what he says, many will fall away and betray one another. There's going to be what? A falling away from the faith. Obviously during the tribulation, because if you don't have the mark of the beast, you're going to be killed. But it is a preparation for that in the day I believe that we're living in now. I mean, we can still have freedom of religion. We can pretty much say what we want. Can we? We don't pray at uh, football games like we used to, do we? Uh, the last baccalaureate that I did, uh, I was warned about what I could say and couldn't say and those kind of things. Um, I, I didn't get that kind of warning early, early in my ministry. You see, things are changing and we're getting just the little, the, the, the little raindrops, sprinkles of what's going to be a downpour as this gets closer and closer and we're not able to express our religious liberty and to share Jesus Christ. But he says here, persecution is going to break out on an unbelievable scale. There's going to be an incredible uh, revival during the tribulation. 
you're going to have, in fact, if you, if you look in the uh, tribulation, what you're going to find is you're going to find that Israel is going to be saved. And out of that salvation is going to come 144,000 evangelists, 12,000 from each tribe. You're going to have an angel that's flying around, that's preaching. You're going to have two witnesses that can't be killed and that finally are killed and then are raised from the dead and the whole world sees it. You're going to have people coming to the Lord in unprecedented ways in an, in an unprecedented scale. But there'll be persecution that'll be a part of that because the Antichrist will feverishly try to stop this and he won't be able to. And so you're going to have all of these people that'll be turning in other people. It'll, it'll just be a horrible thing of betrayal during this time. Now, as we get closer to this in our own day, we're going to see more and more of that. I mean, you can't do this. You can't, you can't say this. You, you can't uh, stand up for your rights. You can't speak against certain things that the Bible talks about. You can't stand that. You can't speak against homosexual marriage, or you can't speak against abortion, or you can't speak against these things. These are quickly becoming reality. And so we're seeing the harbingers of this coming. But then he says there's going to be a defection, a turning away. Why? Because it's too costly to be a Christian. It is just going to cost too much. I mean, I can't sacrifice my job. I can't sacrifice my living. I can't sacrifice these things. I mean, if I, if I don't do what they want me to do at work, I could give you statistics right now of people that are telling me things that they have to do at, at work as far as agreeing with things and uh, that are going on. I'm not going to be real specific about that, but it's, it's compromise. That's all it is. And if they don't go along, well, they, they either are not promoted are they conveniently dismissed? And so that's just another harbinger of something that's going to be so blatant. It'll be extermination if you don't believe it. It'll be like Russia. It'll, it'll be sending you to Siberia. It'll, it'll be to re-education camps. It'll be to all of these things. These things are coming. Finally, the Bible, the Bible it tells us here in verse 14, that the gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world. Now, we have the technology today to do that, don't we? And we're seeing more and more of that. We are so close to the end. We are so close to God coming. What is really the message that I would give you out of this incredible epidemic that we're experiencing right now? The world has come together in on a common goal of defeating a disease. What if the world would come together for Jesus Christ? And he said, that's not going to happen. Well, I know the Bible says it's going to be worse and worse at the end time. And that's exactly what we're talking about. But wouldn't it be incredible if we could really pray? We don't know the time. We don't know the day. That's what he's talking about. Be ready to warn other people to say, you know, this COVID thing is just a small seed compared to the incredible plant that's about to grow up and lead to destruction of a lot of the entire world. The day of the Lord is coming. Yes, it's going to bless those that know it, but it's going to be incredibly disastrous. For those that don't, we as Christians should become so motivated by all of this that we look at people in a different way. Not just can they be carrying COVID, could they possibly contaminate us? But do they have something far worse than the virus? Do they have an unconverted soul? Do they have a soul that is going to meet Christ for all of eternity? in judgment there on the day of the Lord and either be accepted into his kingdom or to be rejected for all of eternity. God help us to get motivated to do something about it. 
and to, yes, to be thinking about these things, you know, is this, this, is this, that, and all of these things and ask these questions. That's okay. But the real important question is, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Because I know the reality of what's going to happen. I've already got the history book. I already know the difference between BC and AD. This is his story. And it's going to end exactly the way God said it's going to end. His way. Revelation is coming. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. This world will be judged by God. It is a reality that Jesus Christ is alive at the right hand of the Father. It is a reality that he's coming back. To reward his saints and to judge those who've rejected him. Don't be a part of those who've rejected him. I wanna encourage you this morning. If I'm speaking to somebody who's thinking about all these things, it's so simple to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's so simple to come to him. All you have to do is confess the fact that you're a sinner. Confess the fact that you you don't have the righteousness that's necessary to get into heaven. You don't have what it takes. You can't pay for your sins. You can't atone for one single one of them. You can't get into heaven because you have to be perfect. But he is perfect. And he atoned for every one of your sins. So you believe in Jesus Christ for that. You believe he is the son of God. You believe he died on the cross for you. You believe that he gives you eternal life. And you ask him to come in. You accept his gift. And then you are changed for all of eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. Lord, may we be motivated by COVID, by this virus, by this world awakening to something that could take our lives. If there's something even more certain than that the judgment of Almighty God against sin and sinners, against those who've not been protected by the blood of Jesus Christ, those who've not had their sins atoned for, those that would have to face him in judgment and give an account and try to explain and in some way present their righteousness, which would be futile. God, I pray for those right now that they would say a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. I now repent of my sins. I'm sorry. I ask you, God, to come into my heart. Forgive me. Take me to heaven when I die. I surrender my life from this point on to you. You are my Lord. I am your child. From this day forward, you are my life. And all these things we pray in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake, amen. God bless you for being here this morning.
Thank you for joining Orchard Hills Church this morning with our online worship service. May God bless you and your family this week. We hope you will continue to help us grow with your giving and weekly tithes. If you go to www.orchardhillschurch.com, you will see the Click Here to Give Online button. A box will pop up, and if you follow the instructions and enter the appropriate information, your giving will go right to Orchard Hills Church. You can also give through a PayPal account by clicking the Learn More button and selecting Online Giving. Join us each and every Sunday at 10.30 in the morning for our worship services. We welcome you to come grow with us.